Hello and welcome to episode 30 of Massalia Tales. In the last episode we saw the beginning of our assault on the Iberian Peninsula, first capturing the island settlement of Ibusim, the Daemons of Polymus, easily wiping aside the meagre Lusitani defenders. We used that victory as a springboard to take Kard Hadash, the first settlement on the peninsula itself, and rushed in with the Daemons of Polymus and the hands of the Jimukoi combining to be a powerful invasion force. Meanwhile, our allies, the Carthaginians, are waging war against the Sesitani, capturing nearby territories it seems we'll have to share the peninsula with them. Now, Cretheus moved up into the interior and was attacked by a Lusitani force coming out of the fog of war. The enemy had an advantage, and their lighter forces did really well against our phalanx, surprisingly so. But in the end, the staying power of Cretheus' heavy infantry and the lack of any enemy attacks to our flanks allowed us to defeat them. He moved on to try and kill the survivors, but was ambushed by a Lusitani army, about a third of a stack, plus the survivors of that battle will now have a chance for revenge against Cretheus. Let's see how he can do. Cretheus took his Massalian warriors forward once again, following the routing units from the battle even after they reformed and began a suspiciously orderly retreat. Seeking to secure a peaceful border to fulfill earlier promises he had made to the people, the young general pushed on despite the unfamiliar territory and the surprising unwillingness of local residents to offer any help. Sure enough, towards the end of a day's march there was an eruption of noise from a tree line flanking his route, and a thousand fresh Lusitani troops appeared. Cretheus' phalanx was momentarily vulnerable, but he knew how to make that moment yet shorter. So Cretheus' column has encountered a Lusitani ambush, attacking his marching position from two sides. However, they've made a critical ambushing mistake. By attacking the front of the column, while the rest of the column is able to move around unmolested by their advance. So I am free to simply run away from this ambush. I can just fall back and form a coherent line further down the hill, so that the enemy won't be attacking on two sides, will have to join together to attack my front. My units are slow moving though, which makes things difficult, and the position I've chosen makes, makes me vulnerable to a rear attack from their reinforcements who happen to be coming onto the field right behind where I need to set up. Inconvenient. Now one unit of pikemen was caught by the enemy's advance, moving too slowly to get away. But that in some ways proved to be useful, because this unit of pikes will distract pretty much every enemy unit who are just attempting to attack the nearest Massalian to them. So these guys turn around and stand there to hold off the entire enemy army. They only have to hold for a few minutes in order to set up my defensives just behind them. So I form a coherent pike line here, and they're going to be able to hold off anything the enemy throw at them now. They go into pike phalanx, but then I immediately decide to actually just advance rather than stand there to help save my men and to counterattack the enemy's cavalry. I want to pin down with my hoplites. The initial unit of pikemen is almost defeated. They managed to rush back through my line just before they round. They didn't lose all that much troops, but their morale was shaken by being fighting while totally surrounded out there. But now that they've managed to get out of the way, the enemy have to push against the front of my pike phalanx with their medium and light troops, which isn't going to get them anywhere, so that's perfect. Meanwhile, my pelters and archers will fire over the top into the large blobs of enemy troops and do damage. Stopping that plan was an enemy cavalry attack coming from my left flank which rammed into my archers and I believe those cavalry destroyed an entire regiment of my archers fighting there even as my hoplites came in to attempt to defeat those cav, the archers were just too weak and too quick to be defeated. The initial unit of pikemen who held off the enemy at the beginning now goes and stands behind my army with the same objective to hold off the enemy's rear attack if it arrives before I defeat the rest of the enemy's army. Meanwhile, Cretheus and some of my cavalry are chasing around some of the enemy's lighter troops. Those guys aren't going to last very long against the very heavy cav commanded by Cretheus, so we quickly defeated them and can now return to the main fight where you can see I've got the enemy severely outflanked with pike phalanxes and driving away their cav with hoplites and more cav of my own, and Cretheus is ramming home with his heavy cavalry into the back of the enemy's formation. A dangerous move, there's loads of spearmen in this formation so we can't hang around. But just doing cycle charges is enough to really damage their morale, especially because it's downhill very slightly cycle charges, which means I actually inflict a good number of casualties on the enemy as I hit. So the enemy there 
aren't going to last very long at all under that sustained attack. Meanwhile, these lancers are distracting the enemy's best unit away from the fight, the enemy's general with his very heavy melee infantry. Those guys could do extreme damage if they hit the back of my phalanx. Luckily, I've got them totally aggroed onto those lancers so you can just keep pulling them away, leaving their lighter and medium forces to just be destroyed against my pike phalanx. Mainly it is the missile units doing the killing, but some of these guys are pretty handy with a sword and are managing to cut down the enemy as they try and get through the pipeline. So now I'm going to try and advance up that pipeline and just drive the enemy back. You can see the enemy is starting to rout. I'm out of ammunition with most of my missile units. I've just got a few arrows left to want to save for the other attackers coming from the south. But this part of the battle is over by the looks of things, so it's time to turn my army around and face the south part of the map. Luckily the enemy haven't gotten too close yet, so I have plenty of time to form up. My pelters form the first line whilst my heavy infantry continue to deal with the remaining enemy forces. I also release the war dogs to destroy these light spearmen in the hope of both keeping them occupied and killing them more quickly so my heavy infantry could go back and join the new line starting on the south. You can see well, that's what I'm doing now with all of these guys. We're going to have a pretty decent looking line, not as thick as it was before, but enough to hold the enemy. Meanwhile, all the routing units are being pursued by my cav because if they were to stop routing, they would come back and then rear attack my new position. So I need to keep driving them off the field using those cavalry. Meanwhile, the enemy's very heavy melee infantry, their general's unit, has been caught up by my Hoplites and Cretheus, my two best units really, who are holding them down in melee combat pretty well, quite far away from the main fight, so there's no chance of them interfering with my plans over here. My phalanx and pelters are taking missile fire from enemy slingers. Some of them are starting to die as well because the health of these units is getting pretty low as the battle drags on. So the missile fire is becoming an increasing problem. But once all of these spearmen commit, I'll be able to use cavalry to get rid of them. But of course those spearmen are going to damage my men as well. They hit me with a volley of javelins which kills pikemen and peltists alike. But then they rush onto the front of the pike phalanx, exactly what I need them to do. They're going to be uh, rained upon by the arrows that I have remaining and stabbed at by the pike phalanx. You can see I get some friendly fire but she kills loads of my own phalanx there. Very annoying. They also commit their heavy cavalry against the front of the pike phalanx, which is ideal. They should be using those heavy cavalry to defeat my medium cav, which they easily could. But because they're not doing that, I am free both to outflank their main position and to use my medium cavalry to attack those slingers to stop them from attacking me. So overall, a perfect combination of enemy mistakes is allowing me to do very well in this situation, actually. And now you can see the enemy are really down to just grinding against my pike phalanx. I don't have any forces left to do anything else. But I have plenty of initiative left, especially with my cavalry. They can come in to smash these enemy infantry from behind, pushing them into the pike phalanx, which is already beginning to defeat them from the front. The enemy are demoralized and start to rout, and that causes a chain route of all of their remaining forces, including their general. It's a decisive victory for Cretheus' army. We did take some casualties among some of our best regiments, but overall, a combination of many enemy mistakes and a bit of luck means that this ambush went perfectly well, and now we're ready to push on. Quickening, yet warming news. Cretheus was foolish to advance as he did, but has managed to turn it into a stroke of greatness. I wonder how many more ambushes lie ahead as we advance. The lands we have walked thus far are hardly any more loyal to the Lusitani than they are to us. For the West, the Lusitani will be able to count on people of their blood to stall our every move, deny all provision and aid, and mislead and abuse us until their plans to strike are complete. And yet, to not advance will make Jelon rile the people up against our phantom cowardice. So then, our plans of attack start now. So Cretheus has crushed the ambushers. This means he is pretty much free to continue advancing if he wishes into enemy territory. We can see the results here are pretty good. A couple of hundred losses among Cretheus' men, but the enemy losing thousands of troops. Overall, a perfect result. You can't really tell it's an ambush at all from the battle results right here. So I had the question of enslaving or killing the captives. I decided that Cretheus mistrusting Lusitani would probably kill them to make sure that no one could escape or generally cause any more devious trouble as a slave. 
So you can see he's now pretty close to Kartuba. Kretis could attack it right now, moving into the province of uh, Baetissa there. But I decided I probably wasn't going to because I didn't know what sort of strength they had. I decided to try and take on this tiny stack, moving Kretis closer towards it. We can see the enemy have a couple of forces by the town. The town is heavily garrisoned, but overall it's not all that powerful. So if I just regenerate my forces, I stand a good chance against them. For now, I'm just going to fortify this border position to see if the Lusitani attack me. If they do, that's even better. We'll drain their forces yet further, making them grind against that fortification. Now as for Eusebius, he also has a chance to advance into this new province. There's this town of Gadira, which is undefended as far as we know, but the fog of war covers the route, which of course means there could be an ambush. I decided to carefully advance in a couple of stages, just to see if I spotted anything. It didn't look like I was going to encounter any enemies, so I just rushed forward and attacked, and you can see I was safe to do so. I reached the town, seeing that the garrison isn't particularly good, the balance bar is super far in our favour. So I'll just auto-resolve this one. You can see some of the results are only a close victory despite our massive advantage, superior troops, upgrades and experience. All of it doesn't really add up to much even when this balance bar seems to be very favourable. So much so I decided to quick save in case this auto-resolve actually turned out to be a disaster. But it wasn't too bad. Eusebius cuts down the defenders and moves into the town. We take about a 20% casualty rate, so exactly what the auto resolve predicted. Kind of annoying, especially because it's among heavy infantry. But because I'm going to occupy this town, and being in the town gives At you a bonus command. to your replenishment rate, I'll get those troops back probably straight away uh, in the next end turn sequence. So now it's time to start spending money on upgrading that town, turn it over to be more like how I need it and to progress into the end turn sequence, where you can see the Carthaginians destroy the Sestani in their final settlement of Arce there. So that's my long-term potential enemy and former actual enemy destroyed by my new ally. It does mean though that the Carthaginians now control lots of territory in between my new gains and the actual Massalian Republic further north, so perhaps a worrying situation for them to be in. Anyway, you can see here confirmation the Sestani have been defeated, two huge Carthaginian armies still standing around. We'll see what they do next, they're probably going to push further into Iberia. I've got another message here telling me about a motivated populace here in Carthaginensis, the province in which Carthadash is the capital. You can see that things are going really well due to characters apparently and military presence. Homer is uh, holding down people due to his military presence and I believe that there may be some agents around who are giving character bonuses as well as Cretheus who is soon to leave the province so won't have that too much longer. But still good news, the Iberians are definitely on our side, at least in the areas we've captured or are rapidly becoming on our side. You can see the Lusitani have fortified right in front of Cretheus, meaning he now can't move without attacking them. But I realise that's kind of a good thing, because now Eusebius can just move up and freely besiege the city of Kartuba here, which is completely undefended. You can see the balance bar is really far in our favour, I could attack it just now. But uh, actually, I can make it even more far in my favour by besieging the garrison force inside using Eusebius. And then Cretheus will be able to just defeat the small army that's outside without the garrison reinforcing. So that's absolutely perfect. He is going to defortify and move forward to attack the little stack. The balance bar, this time, very far in our favour. The enemy has no presence, and yet I still can't get 100% remaining force. We can't wipe them out completely. Uh, perfectly, that is. But still, 99%, that's good enough. We wipe the enemy out, move on, losing 30 men. I enslave the couple of men who I capture. They can't do too much harm. So now the city of Kartuba is in a bit of trouble, going to be attacked by both the daemons and the hands of the Timukoi. The balance bar is even more in our favour, although the, the difference isn't all that much made by just those two units. So I'm going to quickly auto-resolve this one. That's another major settlement captured. The Lusitani are losing territory fast, and we're gaining it fast. Importantly, gaining it instead of the Carthaginians, meaning very rapidly we're going to be on equal terms with them. Previously, the Carthaginians have been much more powerful than us. This land grab might make us an equal partner in the alliance. So Eusebius now garrisons the town, and Cretheus has enough movement points actually to move all the way back to where Eusebius just was in Gadira. This is perfect because I want him to come and defend this area. The Lusitani have an army just to the south here that could just go and retake the town from me if I don't hold it until that army can be dealt with, or until I push over the sea and actually capture another settlement from the Lusitani. 
The capture of Kartuba means that Boedissa is now unified under our rule. I'm going to start converting it to Greek culture and generally undermining the Lusitani's former power here. There's plenty to do. I can also regenerate the daemons in the town. Next turn, both of our armies should be very healthy and ready to push on if the public order situation allows. You can see the Lusitani still have many settlements in Africa and that's where their main forces appear to be. They still haven't moved to counter my moves towards their homeland, which is strange. I imagine they're about to start. Even their home province of Lusitania is vulnerable to attack. Eusebius could move from Kartuba to come and take their overall capital, which really would hammer home victory in our Iberian campaign. There's also the town of Numantia, which is part of the province I'm trying to take, also shared now with the Carthaginians. And I realize that Gelon, currently standing around in Massalia, might be better used actually going to capture that region. It'll take him a few turns to walk there. And I am doing a little bit of a gamble here that nothing will go wrong. You could see that the Celtiberian Confederation had forces also just standing by Massalia for no particular reason. So I am now quite vulnerable to betrayal, but hopefully this will pay off. Going into the next turn, the Celtiberians don't attack, so that's some good news. But the bad news is that the Lusitani actually did want to take Gadira back. They arrive with an army that isn't actually very powerful to challenge Crethia, so it's very lucky I did manage to move him back to this position. You can see the auto resolve results are absolutely disastrous, despite our massive advantage on the balance bar. I can't tolerate losing up to 40% of my army just holding off this small force, so I'm going to have to fight this one myself, and I'll show you a few highlights. <laughs> Look at these poor little Greeks, so far from home, so far from safety, driven to the end of the world by the greed of their people. I have heard many tales of their greatness, many stories of armies that shake the ground with their march and drain the rivers with their thirst. Usually it is only you, my warriors, who inspire such tales. So today will be a good fight. Many of you have already lost your homes to these overconfident poets, but today the loot and glory you shall gain will repay those losses so generously that your horse will beg for another Massalian invasion, so that you may once again gain the wealth to enjoy their services every night of the year. Cretius's men prepare to hold the town, defending the choke points as usual. The militia holding the main road into the town, with his more heavy phalanx troops defending the road into the centre towards the beach area. And on this little upper cliff area, a few ragtag elements of light and heavy forces, a mix of hoplites and a proper phalanx in the main line there. The enemy's attack though is mostly focusing on the central route towards my pike phalanx, so that's quite useful for me. They're going to hit heavy with all of their forces right up this road down the center. A few other guys will go up to the cliffy area on the side, where I have a huge numerical advantage, so that's fine. And no one is coming towards the militia forces on the road into the town proper. So they can just come out and attack the enemy in the rear later on in the battle. So the enemy's decisions are making this easy for me. Although you can see the balance bar is actually fairly even, contrary to what we saw on the campaign map. So I guess that's why the auto-resolve looked like it was going to be so difficult. So here the enemy come, leading with some of their lighter forces, pushing right into the pike phalanx, and the fight shall begin. The enemy has plenty of javelin troops, and you can see those javelins are immediately doing damage to my pike phalanx, but all the ones who can't throw javelins are just going to be wasted, stuck, trying to push through towards my front line while the pikes keep them at bay. Here are some of those light javelin troops, they've got nice high ground as well, throwing over the top of their allies right into my pike phalanx, and very quickly they're going to inflict some heavy casualties. This pike phalanx is actually going to take a real beating holding off the enemy, and it's mainly because of those enemy javelin squads. They both got hundreds of kills each, throwing into these pike phalanx ranks and killing a few of the lighter troops behind them, so dangerous stuff over there. Meanwhile on the cliffs, my men are just preparing to receive the attack from the enemy's small detachment. My pike phalanx presents its weapons to the enemy's spear troops who just run right into it and are head stopped. Both of their regiments actually pile uh, into the front of that phalanx, leaving the other nearby troops uh, to go and flank them out quite easily. You can see I've also put tons of missile troops up here, including these peltis and archers. My original plan was to have these peltis throw down from the cliffs into the enemy's main blob, but actually they don't have the range to throw down there, which is unfortunate, so I can't do that, I'll have to move the peltis back. Meanwhile, the enemy's peltis, or equivalent, these javelin men, will be bombarding my line, throwing over the top of this huge blob of enemy troops, most of which, as I said, are wasting themselves, waiting to attack the phalanx. 
but a huge pile of Massalian bodies is building up. Those javelin have done damage, enough damage to break up the pike formation, meaning I don't have as many pikes facing forwards as I really need to hold the enemy off properly. That means that in a lot of places the enemy will engage me in melee, and the enemy does have some heavy melee troops in there who will do well against my men fighting with the swords. You can see a huge pile of Massalian bodies all along the line there. Really damaging stuff fighting against this force with the javelins in support. And very soon you can see we have situations like this, where there's just one rank of forward-facing pikes, effectively not really doing anything, but the enemy's ranks still hold back and don't actually advance into them for whatever reason. I guess they needed to re-give the attack order. But it does mean a lot of my men are fighting in melee, and that's going to be a hard fight. You can see from the tooltip we've already lost loads of troops and we're going to lose even more. Hundreds of casualties among our pike phalanx. But luckily, my militia forces have finally gotten round to the enemy's rear and are just setting up, ready to attack. At the moment, they're just waiting, but once I give the order, they will rush in there and be able to do some heavy damage. Now, an interesting thing happened on the cliff area. One of the units routed up there, but then came back from routing while I wasn't noticing and came to sneak attack the rear of my army. Unfortunately for them, I happened to have some pelters hidden or partially hidden just behind them as they came in. So they bombarded that enemy squad with javelins, killing a number of them. And then I deployed my very limited number of remaining shock cavalry to rush in and hit these guys. Just to add insult to injury, I released the dogs on them as well. So as the enemy turned to try to escape from the shock cavalry's advance, the dogs run them down. The enemy shatter and are then torn apart by the dogs as they attempt to escape from behind my lines. And then the dogs, of course, can go on to join the main fight, chasing more routing units and doing damage to the enemy's lighter troops. So it wasn't much longer until the enemy's main block of troops was uh, defeated by the front of my phalanx combined with the rear attack by the citizen militia. Most of them start routing and now the casualties they've inflicted on us, which are very heavy among some units, particularly in the middle there, can finally be avenged. The enemy will attempt to escape through the corner of my phalanx line there, so I'm going to push in to kill as many of them as I can before they escape. I can also push my cavalry in to pursue them. Overall, the enemy's troops stand quite little chance of escape going through the town like that, and the majority of them are killed as they try and escape. A decisive victory is declared for Cretius' forces. It was a defence that was harder than I expected and validated the auto-resolve's uh, prediction that we would lose a lot of troops defending this town because indeed we lost many of our heavy infantry but still this victory means we have gained land and kept it and will continue to do so next time. The stalemate between the Carthaginian and Lusitani forces in Central Africa was the selling point of the war for Massalia's military leaders and was proving to be even more fruitful than expected. The constant risk of attack on their borders left the Lusitani homelands open to attack a weakness noted and exploited by the two armies of Eusebius and Cretheus, crisscrossing paths to take as much land and keep it as could be achieved before the war was over. Of course, the Carthaginians and the pro-Lusitani Celtiberian Confederation noticed the exploitative move by their wealthy new ally and were justifiably concerned. 